the title of this talk has changed like three times as I give it. I learn, you know, change a little bit and realize like, okay, got to figure out a better way to identify exactly what we're trying to go through here. So for me, um, I'm going to talk about really taking raw data, transforming it into something that hopefully is usable for doing, whether it be analytics, um, you know, or some kind of transformation, which we may have done previously outside of the database, but there's a lot of power in Postgres to help us do that internally. So this is me, Ryan Booz. I currently work at Redgate. Redgate is a database tooling software company based in England. They have primarily, for 25 years, been in the SQL Server and Microsoft platform space. Uh, they acquired Flyway. We acquired Flyway, which a lot of you probably have heard of. It's a migration tool for doing database migrations as you upgrade and change your schema. Uh, acquired it in 2019 and been putting a lot of energy into it. There's still an open source version of it. Um, and we now support, the, even that open source version supports upwards of like 60 some database connections to do migrations to, Snowflake and all the others. So uh, I am Ryan Booz just about everywhere. So, you know, LinkedIn, wherever you, you have, um, you can come find me. I love to chat, don't be afraid to reach out. I'll leave this here for a second, and it's also at the end. So I was doing the, I, I had this conversation on Twitter yesterday. You're welcome to take as many pictures as you want, but I just want you to know that this deck is already up there. You could download it right now and follow along if you want, um, but it is there. It's a PDF, uh, and it looks like this. Whoops, wrong. Hopefully it doesn't look like that, huh? So this is the repo. I have a presentations folder and all my presentations are there. I try and get everything, you know, anytime I do a talk a second time or a third time, it's always updated. Um, so this will take you to that. It has a SQL script I'm gonna show you at the end and the actual PDF of um, the talk. Oh, sure, yes, you can, <laughs> you can post a picture. I totally get that, you're right. All right. Uh, and I also, so videos like this, if something's recorded and it's public, I just link it to playlists for each year. So my playlists are here, you know, if, if the talk is helpful and you want to go back and watch it, it'll, I'll make sure it gets linked here once it's public, so. All right, so YouTube again, at Ryan Booz. You'll find the stuff there. All right, so here's the talk, right? Five basic sections, and we'll do a little demo at the end. We're going to talk about ELT versus ETL. All right, or actually ETL versus ELT. And then talking about how we can use various features of Postgres to set the building blocks to then go even deeper once you've learned the building blocks. All right, and what I've come to learn about myself and as I go to conferences and talk to people is sometimes it's easy to assume that everyone understands exactly how recursive CTE works or what function in Postgres allows you to split strings in a specific way to get values out and this, you know, this that, and the other thing. Because it feels like once you've done it for a year or two, like, oh, everyone must know this, and realize that that's not the case. So when I first did this talk, it was this monstrosity of all the fun puzzles I had done with advent of code and all the fun things I did to solve all those puzzles. And after about 50 minutes, I'd gotten through three puzzles. I was like, okay, I have to rethink this. Um, and the reality is, I realized that most of the folks that were coming didn't fully understand just some of the building blocks that would help them do these kinds of things in their environments. So that's what the majority of this is. Um, I also, if you go to that GitHub repo, you will find some of the puzzles I've solved over the last two years with advent of code using SQL. And that was a challenge by the Postgres community. It was fun, I love solving puzzles. I've learned a ton about how to better use Postgres and SQL. So advent of code, a lot of this has been, uh, you know, this, uh, I kind of really got into this a couple years ago, trying to better understand how to take what seems like non-relational data and making it relational with Wordle. Uh, back in 2021, I guess, mm -hmm. I was trying to do a sample of, I, I want to take those emoticons, or the emojis, sorry, those little squares and turn them into data I can analyze. And sure, I could do it in a hundred other ways. I could do it in Python. I could do whatever language, this and that. But I thought, what if I could just take the, in this case, the tweet, the text of the whatever we call them now, shove it into a database, and then with SQL alone, transform it into a table of data that I could actually analyze. And in learning how to do that, I discovered new things about Postgres I had no idea about. I didn't understand what was going on, and that opened up the opportunities. So both of these were kind of the, the on-ramp for me, 
and that's why I'm going to use them as some examples today. Uh, most everything you'll see here is available in Postgres 9.6 forward. There are one or two functions that I will show you or, or in the SQL that are only in Postgres 14 plus, all right? Uh, I'll point out the one I think that's in here. There are a couple others. So when we get to the samples, some of the SQL I'll show you in slides and then when I do the demo, I'm primarily using these two puzzles. So you can go to Advent of Code, you can go look at the, the content, the puzzles, what you're supposed to solve. Almost, uh, I think for any of the years they've done it. This has been on for, I don't know, does anyone know, 12, 13 years, something like that. So I picked day seven for both years. It was totally a coincidence. I actually didn't realize that until I put the slide together. Uh, so day seven, December 7th puzzle for 2023 is really simple. And uh, you know, it's a very simple kind of input and allows me to show a lot of this. And then uh, last year's day seven. So basically the, the 2023 puzzle is just a simple line. It represents a hand of five playing cards and then a value. And the puzzle was to split all these things out, understand the cards, and then you do some addition and multiplication based on a bunch of other things. But you gotta take that string and do something with it. And so that, it just allows me to show you something uh, pretty easily. And then the order of the cards in the hand, left to right, one, two, three, four, five, is important to later solving the, the problem in the puzzle. Last year's day seven uh, is gonna be familiar to a lot of us. And that's one of the reasons we use things like recursive CTEs. It was basically about moving up and down through a folder system on a computer. And so we can take the input, the command CD, and uh, you know up, down, whatever, and find where all the files are within the folder structure. And again, the, the puzzle was basically to find, I think, the folder that had the least amount of data uh, to delete that folder because you needed to add a file. You needed to free up space. Um, but again, it's moving up and down through file system, which all of us have done at some point. So let's talk about ETL versus ELT. So who has heard of ETL? Most of us have. Who has heard of ELT? A little uh, uh, fewer of us. So the whole point of ETL is to take non-relational data and convert it into something that's relational so that we can use the power of SQL to analyze that data. Now the data can be a text file. The data can be a grouping of you know, a text file and connecting to another system like Snowflake and bringing that together. Connecting to a parquet file with a text file, with, you know, whatever the sources are, be many different sources, but you're trying to get that, relate it, turn it into something that you can get into a database and do analytics on. The differences are really minor, but really you know, powerful depending on which way you want to handle this data. Right? Extract, transform, and load is primarily external. There are tools that have been built over the last 25 and 30 years to do this for you. Right? They're specialized tools, and they can do all kinds of transformations, but they're special, they cost money, and it's outside of the thing you're ultimately going to use, which is the database. Extract, load, transform is just that small difference. We're still extracting. We're getting the data from wherever it's at, but then we're going to load it into the database first and then use the power of SQL, Postgres, and the things we can do there to transform it. So why would we do one over the other? Well, let's talk about ETL briefly. Why has it been so popular? And it has been popular for a long time. This is the primary way that we take all this disparate data and turn it into something we can query. It's been popular for a couple reasons. It's not reliant on a specific database, right? It's an often external tool that can pull all these things together, often kind of in a pipeline, you chain events together to process data in some form that eventually gets it into a table-like thing that you insert into a database, and then you move forward. Databases, the other, you know, probably the primary reason is as the web grew, most of the databases we use, at least until the last couple of years, did not speak the language of the web very well. Right, so it used to be XML a long time ago, and then the last 15 plus years we've been using JSON for everything, and most databases didn't have a way to store JSON efficiently and to query it well. Right, so we had to have something else to transform that thing to get into the database so we could do it. Well, that's that's changed, or is starting to change pretty dramatically. Then honestly, one of the other reasons it still exists and still popular is it developed an entirely new class of jobs. And so people have learned and they become experts in these tools. The tools 
often costs a lot of money for the licenses. You might only have a team of two or three people, but they're really valuable. And it's hard to want to get rid of that like you know special uh, team if you're not sure that you can do everything you need to otherwise. All right. Well, one of the problems, at least in my experience, has been though with ETL is because it's external, iterating when new things happen can be really slow because you're relying on an external tool, you're relying on people, you usually have to have these different requests, you have to then decide as a DBA or developer, okay, what's that mean to my schema? What do I need to change? If I add the columns I need and I give that request forward, are they gonna understand it? And Am I gonna actually get the data I need? So there's a lot of iteration that's outside of the database and it slows things down. You can't kind of go uh, as quickly as you'd like. Now, if you can keep that processing in the database, closer to the database at least, you get a lot more control over those iterations. Right? You, you have things like temporary tables. You can try something without actually impacting your schema yet, see if it's gonna work and move forward. You don't need to rely on someone else to do it. And that's really then where I started to learn more about this concept of ELT. Now, I actually, in my career, I'm 22 or 23 years into this whole tech thing. I did a lot of ETL. Uh, a couple jobs ago, we had you know thousands of client databases. We would pull stuff together to have metrics and to you know pull is this client is there kind of data for building data similar to the other clients within this group, this, this region, what have you. But as I started to realize that I had all of this information now with APIs that I could grab, and I could start to do this in the database, this concept of ELT became really important to me, or really interesting at the very least. So. A couple of, of benefits. Number one, it, it retains the whole transactional nature. Right? One of the problems with an external tool is you don't have that control. It's going to process what it's going to process, but if it fails in some way, if you were inserting that data into the database, you would know the rows that got committed got committed. Right? And so you lose some of that because it usually ends up being a batch process and some things, you know, you might lose some of the nature of the data. And Postgres has added over many releases a plethora of functions that can do you know, all kinds of transformations with a lot of data types. Whether it's JSON, whether it's text, whether it's array data, um, there's a lot that you can do. And, and honestly, for me, one of the things that was most helpful or interesting as a developer, you know, my kind of developer um, experience coming to the foreground, it's just something simple like arrays. You know, when I understood years ago that Postgres had an array type, that was mind blowing to me. And then to recognize a lot of these functions end up using or exporting array types, and there's a lot that you can do with that. So this all works together to say I can get some data, and then with a few functions, all of a sudden it's a whole new, it's a whole new thing that I can start to analyze. All right, so ETL versus ELT. One is external, insert the final result. ELT is insert as much as you can, as raw as you can, and then transform it. I want to talk about inserting data because obviously that's, you need to get started. If you're going to load this data, and you have to worry about this with ETL as well, but when you're trying to get this raw stuff in as quickly as possible, you just need to know how to do it. A couple quick slides. A couple things I would say is if you're going to try and work through something like ELT, you want to do your best to get the simplest form of data simplest schema that you're going to add it to first, right? So if I have a text file and maybe it's a CSV, maybe I don't know what columns I want, maybe I don't even want to split it apart yet because I don't know. You could just save rows of, of the CSV to a table. JSON, just save the JSON document, pull out what you want, but keep it simple. Don't get too complex initially. And then post-process all the stuff that's in there, right? So I just have the staging table with all the rows and, and chunks of data, and then I can figure out later how to start to do that. That saves you that step of a lot of time up front. What do I do with this thing first? Well, if I just have access to it, I can go ahead and just start trying, testing, playing with it. If you're gonna copy it in, you know, just a couple quick things. Use copy if it's something like a file. It's probably the easiest thing. Now, um, supported by, you know, most, um, Sorry, is the most important method for getting data in. I'm going to talk to it on the next slide. Typically, CSV. You know, there are other things you can do. You can name your own delimiters if you have custom formats, uh, but it's a good way to get data in. And then I'll just say this. Uh, I worked at Timescale for a couple years, and most of my history is about time series data. And when you get lots of data coming in quickly, 
you learn that it's best to work in batches. And so if you're going to start to ingest a lot of data with Postgres and you're using some kind of, you've developed something, Python, Go, whatever it is, don't insert one row at a time. Batch up 10, batch up 50, and then do an insert, and you'll see the performance go up pretty dramatically just by doing that. Um, go to 500, go to 1,000, test it, see how fast you can get some data into your database. Now, two words about copy, and I just put this here because, again, you're going to walk away. If you haven't used copy much, you go to play with it. I just want to get this stuff in front of you. So copy is a SQL command in Postgres, but it's a Postgres command. It is not in the SQL standard. It actually is a, a predates Postgres as we know it. It was in the older version of Postgres, uh, and it's one of the things that came over. And it requires a file. So if you use the SQL command copy, it's looking locally to the server the file system of the Postgres server. Now, most of us in a production system don't have access to that. Now, there are ways you use a hosted solution like Amazon. There are ways you can use copy to access like ILNS3 and so forth, you know, whether it be in Redshift and some other ways. Uh, but you're looking local. Well, most of us don't have that access. Honestly, even if you're using Docker locally, you probably aren't putting your files in the Docker container. Right, so they're just on your file system. So what you usually then do is use the psql meta command copy. So the slash commands, we call them meta commands. And so it's a meta command called copy. And what that does is it reads the file off your local system. It simply streams it in the, in the copy format into standard in on the server. So you're getting the same benefit, but you don't have to be local to the server. Um, now, the only thing you have to know about copy are there are a couple quick gotchas. Number one. It requires things to be in order. If you're doing a CSV, um, you can't just like name various columns. You can exclude columns, but you have to know the order of the columns going in. Uh, the types have to match. So if you're trying to insert into an integer column and it's text, it's not going to work. I have no idea what this is behind me, but I kind of want to listen. Anyway. Um, and there's no data conversion. So if you have a date format and the string is different than what Postgres expects, it's just going to fail. And the problem is any failure is an error. It stops. And any work that's been done is actually in the database, but it's not visible. And so it's taken space, and it won't go away until you vacuum sometime later. You could have inserted 3 million rows of data, and 3 million and one fails, and you lost 3 million rows of data. Right? you got to start over again. So that's one of the problems with uh, copy, the larger, you know, the more data you insert. However, there are s other tools. So PG Loader is one that I refer people to. If this is a process you're going to do, uh, it's a tool written a number of years ago, started by Dimitri Fontaine. A number of people contributed to it. And it basically takes a file. It allows you to specify various um, transformations if you want. So it can identify that the date format is wrong, and it will transform it before it does the copy for that row. And then if there's an error, it can basically save that row out ahead of time and then just keep going. So that's one tool. There are some others similar to it. If you, again, this is in that playlist. I shared it earlier, but this is a talk I've given a few times. And that's just four plus. There are a whole bunch more that you can play with. But it, a lot of these same principles just to, to go through. Any questions right now? Yes. That's correct. So it is um, textual data with some kind of delimiter. delimiter. It can't handle JSON, doesn't handle XML, things like that. Yep. It's not helpful for things like that. So that's where often, great question. So the question was, you know, is, I should have said that earlier, I apologize. Um, you know, does copy handle something other than just kind of textual data, whether it be CSV or some other delimiter? It's not set up to do that, right? So it won't handle copying JSON in. Now, if delimited correctly and there's a call in this JSON, there are ways to actually get that in and it will work. And sometimes it gets a little bit wonky and people have trouble. But uh, just inserting it directly and trying to transform it in some way wouldn't work. Um, that's where you have to use probably a programming language because you are interfacing with an API and you're getting data out. Well, then just use that, <laughs> whatever language you're using, to save into the table. And then you can go about your business. All right. So when you're doing something like ELT, my, what I've learned over four or five years of just playing with this stuff and helping some clients do things because they're trying to iterate quickly 
is just keep it simple. Back in my older days of ETL, I would, you know, we'd spend a lot of time thinking about the schema we wanted so that we could transform this data, and it was a really long process. But if I'm going to do it in the database, I can just get the data in there. And so keep the initial table simple. The only thing I will say is if uh, when you're inserting data, you're going to see me do this in a little bit, generate an ID column for every row that gets inserted. You don't know when that might be helpful for you later. right? So just so you have the order that things are brought in, there, that might not exist in the data itself. So just create an, an identity column. You'll be surprised. It might be helpful at some point. If it's time series data, maybe put the time series, the timestamp of when it was inserted, right? So you have a time order in some way. That might be, might be something you need. Now there's probably a timestamp of that thing, a metric, a reading, whatever. But you, it might be helpful for you to know it was read five minutes ago, but it was inserted right now in the rows that were inserted in the batches and so forth. Again, I found that to be helpful when it's time series like data. Um, and then again. Just pre-process what makes sense. And I'm going to show you an example in a second. Don't go overboard. Don't try and pull every single piece of information out and get it into a table because in two weeks you're going to change that and you're going to go back. And, it, and I'll show you why in just a second. Just do as little as possible initially and then get into the database and do your work. So this is an example that you'll see a little bit later. So this is that December 7th puzzle. It's just rows of text. So I didn't do anything with the text externally. I simply said, you know, I'm going to copy the data in, and notice I generated an ID column, right? It wasn't part of the file, but that way I have that number in case I need a reference order in some way. Maybe I, maybe I need to do a window function, and I need to look back to some number of, of rows in some way on some ID. You have no idea when that's going to be helpful. Now, Wordle. This is an example, this is a portion of the JSON uh, from the Twitter API a couple years ago. I was reading in a couple million Wordle tweets over the span of a couple weeks, and this was a chunk of what the, the, the JSON looked like. I didn't need all of this. So initially, I just wanted to make sure I was saving them. I didn't want anything to error. I just wanted to get the data in. So my initial table was just this. I was pulling out the time, you know, the timestamp I was saving it. I was pulling out the tweet ID so I could reference it later if needed. And then I just saved the raw JSON. And I just let that thing go. Then I knew I was getting the data and I could work separately on transforming it. This became a part of what I did then as I transformed the data. Now I kept a separate table of the raw JSON. And why I did that is this wasn't my initial go around. I thought, oh, I only need the author handle and you know the tweet text and something else. And then I would iterate a little bit more. I said, oh, you know what? I do want to know the location because maybe I could start to correlate tweets of where people were at. And so I could change the schema, go back to the, you know, I could link on the ID of the tweet, and I could just update this data because I had access to it. Now, if you're storing all that data, a second time, yeah, that's going to be, it's going to cost, right? You're going to have to store that somewhere. Now, in most cases, if you're in a hosted solution, you'd have some kind of time. You know, I'm not going to store it forever. I'll archive it or I'll delete it. But in Postgres, you could save it to a table space that's really cheap storage. Like if you're in the cloud, that table could be stored out to S3 in some way, right? Or something, some kind of object. So it's really cheap. You have access to it if you need it. It might be slow to get it back later, but you still have it. All right. Does that make sense? Get the raw stuff in as quickly as you can. And this, probably this table, went through two or three iterations before I got to this. Because I just wasn't sure what I would need from that other data. I want to quickly show you this as just an idea. So everything I just talked about was taking your data and putting it into a simple table first. Now what I have learned to do, particularly with the advent of code um, puzzles, is has anyone done the advent of code, any of those puzzles? OK, a couple of you have. So the way they're set up is each day a puzzle gets revealed, and there are two puzzles for one set of input data. It's always about Christmas and usually about elves doing something. And it's always funny and complex and weird. But it is what it is. Um, and I would realize in, in every puzzle, you get a little chunk of sample data. 
right? The actual input is a larger file, but in the descriptions they give you, you know, 5, 10, 15 rows. And it was just easier for me to do a derived table often to start. I didn't want to deal with schema. I didn't want to create tables. I didn't want to download the, the file and import it yet because the sample data, they give you what the solution should be for that sample data. And so I could work on my solution without importing data, creating tables, or anything. So in this case, it was five rows of playing cards, five playing cards, space, and then the number is a bid. It's a value you do something with later. And so I just copy those into, into this um, regex split to table. So I essentially got rows of data. And I could just then start iterating through ideas of how I was going to process this. And then when it worked, I could create the table, import the main thing, and get my solution. So you'll see me do this sometimes. And honestly, think about it. Like, think about it as an option. If you have a new puzzle, you know, something you're trying to solve, grab a couple rows of sample data or sample text or whatever it is, sample CSV lines. Throw it in something like this so you can get rows and see how you're going to transform it. I'll show you a little bit later. If it doesn't quite make sense to you, I'll show it to you in the demo. You'll understand a little bit more. Now, normally what I will do, because it's really hard, this is what we call a derived table. Right? It's, it's a, well, this isn't quite a derived table, but this is the output from a function. I would have to put this in a subselect if I want, was not going to use a CTE. We're going to talk about CTEs in a minute. And so normally what I do is I grab my text, I throw it in a CTE so it looks like the table I want, I'm probably going to do later. And the other reason I do it this way is, again, I don't have to iterate any schema. I'm simply changing this. There's no table action yet going on. It's just function output. If I end up with more columns, it just is here. I can iterate. And then I can create the table that I am ultimately going to want for the final solution. Now, I want to quickly point this out. Who knows about dollar quoting? Who's used it in Postgres? All right. Super helpful. There's a lot of ways you can go about it. So there's a couple places you have probably used this if you've programmed within Postgres. Um, that is when you do like a, a function. You have to do dollar quotes around the function because there's text inside. Or you have to do a, an anonymous function, right? So something that's just you're creating on the fly. It basically creates a, a block of code. In this case, dollar quoting is really about the text. This becomes a string literal. And I don't have to worry about you know, escaping characters and escaping carriage returns. It's just helpful. I use it often in formatting. So rather than doing a single quote and putting the stuff in and doing backslash or whatever, I'll just do two dollar signs, encase the string, and then I have a literal string to start to work with. All right? So that's what I'm doing here. I'm taking the literal five lines out of the text file. I have to worry about the carriage returns or anything else. And then I'm feeding it into a function in some way. Just a helpful hint. Hopefully, you've already caught one or two things that you didn't know about. All right, so let's run through this. Basic building blocks. So I have data. I figured out some way to quickly start to get to it and iterate it. And I have lines. I have table rows coming out somehow. And I've got to take that data and do something with it. So there are a couple functions that I think have Maybe you're doing it, and you don't fully understand what's happening. So that's what I'm going to go through. The first is cross-joining. We've probably heard about cross-join. Cross-joining is when you take two tables or more than two tables, and you join them with what we call cross-join. And it basically says for every row in the table on the left of that join, iterate every row in the table on the right. The output is a product of both tables. You know, if there's 10 rows in one table and 10 rows in another table, you're going to get 100 rows. We can demonstrate this really easily with something like generate series. Right? I'm saying generate a series from 1 to 2, cross-join it with another series from 1 to 4, and you'll notice that I get 8 rows. So 1 iterated through each of the other rows, 2 iterated through each of the other rows. Why do I care about cross-joins? <laughs> well, we get to cross-join laterals. And this is so tremendously helpful for taking data and iterating and processing it through a SQL query. Here's what this means. When you cross-join, when the right-hand table of a cross-join is a function, is a set returning function. I gave you an example earlier, like the regexp split to table. 
I think that's what it was. We, it is actually considered, it is uh, implicitly what we call lateral join. And that means the table on the right can reference any output from the table or function on the left. And all of that output from all of those tables or functions gets fed back up to the select and it can be referenced. So this becomes kind of cool, which hopefully you'll see in a minute. So again, functions can, uh, anything on the left. And then I call it kind of the reach back because later in the query, I can pick and choose from any of those outputs, however they were processed, to make my final query in some way. One quick helper, in all of my demos, I don't use, I don't actually say cross-join lateral. It's just a lot of typing, I don't care. <laughs> the comma means cross-join, and again, because in this case, the right-hand table, which is actually the second generate series, they're both gen uh, set returning functions, but in this case, it's on the right, that comma implicitly means cross-join lateral, all right? That's just how Postgres works. It's in the documentation, you can read it. I don't have to say cross-join lateral, it's implicit. When it's a, it's a set returning function on the right. And so this is kind of what you can look at it as. Like on the, you know, I have a select statement. I'm selecting from table T and then I have a comma and I'm feeding some kind of function in here. In this case, it's string to table, right? So I have string to table as my comma, right? It's a function and I'm referencing table T column A. And whatever that is, I'm basically saying split on nothing and it's gonna uh, iterate the rows. You'll see examples of this in a minute. Now I do another comma, and because the second thing is also a set returning function, it can refer to any of the output above it, or on the left, as it were. And then all of this stuff gets piped back up to the top, and notice in my select statement, I can reference all of those things as tables and any columns that come out of those functions. It's a lot of back and forth. Why would you do it? You'll see a couple of examples later. It's just a really fun way and really useful way to process complex data as we're trying to transform it. So uh, it also can simplify SQL higher up. And there's some fun ways if you go and look at some of the advent of code solutions, you can actually then use something like values, which you can kind of reiterate and reform some of the data. A lot of things you can do with it. Um, but then I threw this in the middle. Now that we have a function in the from clause, it's gonna become really valuable. We can, any function that is a set returning function in the from clause, so it's, it's a table, right? It's returning a set of data. Postgres has this unique thing called with ordinality. Now that means not only do I get the output of that function, but it will simply add an ordinal value with every single row as a new column. I don't have to do order buys, row numbers, higher in the query, anything like that. It's much faster, and you'll see why this becomes very helpful. Again, when you need to know the order of things coming out of that function, this is the best way to do it. Um, anything else here? Yeah, it retains the order of the rows coming out, so you wouldn't have to necessarily do something later to order it to get the row number. What that means is you can take something like this, which is, again, that, that CTE with the, the um, function inside. So I'm saying, hey, add the row number, from regex split to table, and it's gonna get me these five lines, it works. Now in a much larger file, the biggest problem with row number as a window function is it requires, it must scan the entire data set to add the row number, right? It has to do the order by, everything has to be done first, and then it iterates the entire data set again to add the row number. So you're adding overhead. I could instead take the output of that function and simply say with ordinality, and then I'm gonna get the output of the function, that's in this case lines, and then the ID. I just, whatever, you can call it whatever you want. I'm giving it an alias of ID, and I get the exact same thing. Check out with ordinality. I'm gonna show you a couple of examples, and hopefully a little light bulb will go off and you'll see how it can be uh, useful in what you're doing. And then the other thing I said, so we have with ordinality. I wanted to make sure I covered that so this wasn't just thrown out of nowhere. One of the other reasons that I've found to start to use these functions and cross-join laterals really becomes about what happens up top. So this select statement, I've started to transform it, right? I'm now taking, I, I need to get those 
cards, and I want to get each individual card out. Okay, so I'm going to move that to the from clause. I can take any row, so I, uh, let me see, this is not my, yeah, I do have it. This is not my clicker. So this is the lines column out of December 7, right? And so this is splitting it apart, so I'm getting the cards, and then I'm splitting the five values right there in the first row. It's 3, 2, T, 3, K, and I'm splitting them out into 3, 2, T, 3, K individual rows because I need to know the hand it was played in and the order of the cards in that hand. But it's still kind of messy, and so actually I could take that split part, put it in the from as another returning function, so that my query up top just looks nicer. I see a lot of people do that. Like it, again, it might be valuable and helpful to just clean things up a little bit. And then you can iterate down below if you want to change lines or something gets more complex. I just throw it out there because I've seen a lot of people do it. I'm like, you know what, I, I kind of like that. Um, I can hide a lot of things. Here's an example that uh, I actually had to get some help on this one. This is from last year, Advent of Code. This is about a really complex thing. You're removing two ends of a rope throughout a whole grid, and you got to track the position of every end of the rope, blah, 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 blah. So there's an H and a Y and an X and a this. Um, and so notice the select query eventually became pretty simple. right? I had the ends of the rope and the H and the Y, the, uh, the head and the tail of the rope. That looked really nice. And I could hide all the calculations down below in some cross joins, right? So I'm just transforming all this data. And what I'm getting out with um, a couple aliases right here made it much easier to just work on it down below. And the query up top was a whole lot easier to work with than comma and doing all the stuff up there. Any questions on cross join lateral? Sweet. All right, common table expressions. Now, most of us have used common table expressions, I'm sure, but I just want to make sure that we understand a couple points so we can get to recursives. They're often called with queries, depending on the database you come from, because they start with the keyword with. Most of us do CTEs because they are more readable. That's kind of the thing that everyone talks about, right? Um, and so, uh, reference, yeah, so that you're naming a query it's a virtual table, essentially, with a name that you can reference throughout your query. Just note, prior to Postgres 12, um, it was, they were what we called um, materialized. So kind of the query would be run, it would be stored in memory, memoized in some way, so that any time you reference that table, it, it wasn't queried again. Now, in Postgres 12 and above, it ended up becoming inlined, is what we call it. it, it we try to inline it which can help the query plan actually be better. Um, but that also impacted some people's CTEs, so you can add the materialized keyword to have it take the old effect of materializing it first. You can chain multiple of these together. You're going to see that. Um, and again, one of the things that some people don't know is you can actually name the output columns uh, at the CTE. So it doesn't matter what the columns are named in your query. If you want to make sure they have a specific name, you can do that above. So this is what they look like, right? We have with, I name this query CTE1. Now the next query has access to any CTE above it, right? So I can name any table or CTE above it. And so this query currently only has access to the first CTE. Now if I add a third CTE, it technically has access that it can reference either of the other two. Whatever you want to do, one, both, none, doesn't matter. And then eventually you have to have a final query that at least references one of these CTEs to get an output. Pretty simple, right? And one of the reasons we do this is, again, looking back, this is a little bit further down the road for this puzzle that I was trying to solve with the positions and the card numbers and other things. This is a little bit further into the puzzle. And if you don't use CTEs, you probably do two subselects in some way to join it together because you're iterating. And that's just ugly. Like, it's hard to read. And then you, like, the select is actually way up top, but you're doing all these named alias functions. It's just as annoying. And so we switch this around a little bit. We make two CTEs, and now notice how much simpler the query is below. This is why most of us do it. It makes the query itself a lot easier to rationalize about. However, readability is one of the primary reasons we cite. 
it doesn't mean that it's more performant, right? So CTEs can become less performant, particularly the more complex they get. Because you're asking the planner to basically plan a bunch of separate things and then you know, put them together and you're not gonna get the right row estimations all the time out of each CTE, it just becomes annoying. Um, and so it's not always gonna be performant. Honestly, it might be less a lot of the time, but it's probably worth a hit for a number of the things you're trying to do. All right, so CTEs, great. So we can see examples, but then there's recursive CTEs. Who loves recursive CTEs? I love when hands go up. Who has never used a recursive CTE? All right, it's there. They're, they, they feel hard, right? But hopefully they won't seem that way in a second. So the SQL language is declarative. And it's basically batch-based, right? Which means there's no way to iterate the, the query as we go. You get the output. And yes, you might iterate it through, like a cross-join seems that way, right? Where for every row here, we're iterating here. But it's not the same kind of thing as looping over a data set. That's where recursive CTEs come in. Before we had recursive CTEs, SQL was not a Turing complete language. But with recursive CTEs, we can now do complex calculations, which is kind of the marker for a Turing complete language. And so when recursive CTEs were added, were marked as a Turing complete language. Kind of cool. And it really doesn't look, it's, it's, it's a CTE, right? We just did two things. We added with recursive, so we had to add the recursive keyword, and that simply tells the planner, one, of the C, one or more of the CTEs in this chain of a query is going to theoretically refer back to itself. And that becomes the looping, looping mechanism. So in this case, CTE2, I'm referencing both CTE1 and my select statement. I, you know, I didn't want to take too much space. And I'm referencing myself as the CTE2 CTE. And this is going to cause this CTE to first iterate and loop over the process that you set up, the output of which goes on to the rest of what's happening. We often will hear these called hierarchical recursive or CTEs because this is where they're most useful. I want to recurse through something like a folder structure, which we've all done, we've all seen. And so you'll hear this called hierarchy, right? Whether it's buildings and I used to work in uh, utility data. So we'd have buildings, meters, divisions, you know, all these things related and we need to correlate them up to some kind of tree that we were gonna work through. So here's how CTEs work, recursive CTEs. There's two parts to it. And this is where I always have gotten messed up until I start using them more. The first is what we call the initial query. It is a static query. It only gets run once. And it's the setup for the rest of the recursive CTE. The output of this query will determine the data types and the columns for this, uh, the output. So in this case, I had this simple folder. Let's just assume this is the, a table in my database. I have three columns. I selected out the name, the parent folder, and the size. Where parent folder is null. I only had one parent folder, and so I get one row. And I see that the name is folder A. That output becomes the input to the next iteration, which I can then join on. So when I refer to, that's the uh, files on disk, is the table, files on disk. And I'm joining to myself. I call the CTE files. I'm joining the output of the previous iteration, one or many rows. In this case, I'm joining it on the parent folder on the table to the name of the output from the previous iteration. And that's how we start to recurse. And so the output of this, this is what the second iteration would look like at this point. I'm sorry. And then we union them all together. Right, so we have to union, that's, that's a requirement for the, C, the recursive CTE. So we take the first one, it never gets run again, and every iteration takes the output and runs it through the second query. And so iteration one, I got the first row. Iteration two, I got five rows because all of them had folder A as my parent. All right. I'll show you uh, how this completes uh, in the demo. Now recursion, this is a caution, right? Recursion continues until it's 
until it finishes, until there's no output. Or you put a limit on it. Well, if you don't put a limit on it and you don't know when it's going to end, you end up in an infinite loop. So you got to know that you're going to have an output or your CPU is going to go and everyone's unhappy. Um, so just make sure there's an endpoint or add one arbitrarily. A where clause that you know is going to end the thing in some way or a limit, whatever that might be. And then this is my caution. I have like four or five talks. Like I love arrays. I love range types. And I find for myself, every time I learn something fun and new, all of a sudden it becomes, have you ever heard this, the saying, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail? That becomes these tools for me. I'm like, oh, I love recursive CTEs now. Every puzzle, I'm going to find a way to use recursive CTEs. And then it's like the stupidest thing. And I just needed a window function, and it would have been solved. So just be cautious. Once you get used to them, you're like, this is really fun. Don't use it for everything. <laughs> so all right, let's get to a demo. This is mostly for the recording. Uh, so I'm going to hopefully see if I can put this here. It will at least get recorded so I can show you a couple of these things. So I just want to run through top to bottom. We have 15 minutes. This will take about 10. Now I have time for a few questions. Um, I can increase the font just a little bit more. So I'm going to create this table. This is puzzle one. Five cards, space, and a bid. Right. So I just want you to see it in action. Now in this case, I'm creating the table. I'm cheating here, I'm not using copy because I just wanted to get it done quickly. I didn't want to have to go out to a terminal for you, whatever. I'm just doing a multi-line value insert. I get those five sample rows in, great. And this is all it looks like, all right? Now, I told you about dollar quoting. This uh, just means it's a literal, right? So I'm just selecting the text inside of it, whatever that string literal is. The other cool thing you might not know about is this just can be, they just have to match. So you can do something like that and it will still work. So you can identify your beginning and ending, right? So that it's the $2 signs, but you can actually put a word in the middle as kind of some kind of tag. Kind of cool, right? Um, I don't know why I'm taking this out because it's taking time. Um, and then again, I often use this in procedures and functions when I need to do a, large, a long format of some sort. Like if I'm generating a query inside of a, a, a function in some way, that gets hard. I want it to be I write my query and then I want to replace the various things. This becomes really helpful. I put two dollar signs around my string and then I can just keep it mentally. It, it works for me and I'm just formatting the literal. All right, so this is what I was saying. You know, I get the output whether I often start like this. I take a select statement, run it through something like split to table so I get rows of data I can work with. Now, to use that, I either have to put it in a CTE or I start to do a bunch of subselects, and that's annoying and no one wants to do that. So I often just put it in a CTE so that I can start to look at this. Like everything below the CTE is where I'm starting to think about how I'm going to transform this data, right? This is just my sample data. It was a one off. I don't have to create any schema. And now I'm like, okay, if this was a real table, I'd say slick star from that table. It looks exactly the same. Sorry, I'm using dBeaver. If you know the tool, and I just have to hit control enter, so I'm not hitting buttons, that will execute the query that I'm in. I forgot to say that. Now I showed you earlier, we could do something like this, right? I could do subselect to get the row number, and that works, I get the row number, but if I do, um, sorry, this is in the CTE, who cares about that? Uh, but I can do the same thing with that ordinality. I still get the same thing out. Lots of ways to deal with it. I'm using that sample data, and then I can start to iterate below. So in this case, we're just going to do the first part. right? I now have this fake table of data called December 7 underscore DT. I'm calling it drive table, even though it kind of isn't. And I need to get the parts out. right? I need the ID that I created. That's the hand, right? so each hand of cards. And then I'm taking the first one. I'm calling it the cards, I'm taking the second one, calling it the bid, and now I have three columns. I took that string, used a couple functions, and I split it apart. Cool. Now, if I have the data internally, which I do, I can now say, oh, well that just would have been the exact same thing, but I'm selecting from the table itself. All right, so you can see that I took the sample data, I got the maybe the initial query, and now I could import the data do the select and it just works, because I know my sample matches the other input. So now I have December 7th. I'm not going to keep using the temporary stuff. 
And in this case, we need to do second part. So now I don't need to just know the hand of cards. Later in the puzzle, I actually need to know the order of the cards. So how do I turn a string into something tabular? I pivot it, right? I just break each of those things apart and I pivot it so I can identify each individual card within the hand. So I'm gonna have two IDs in some way. So the first one is the ID from my table that indicates the hand from all of these plays. And then I have the card that comes from my split to table down here. So I'm saying of the string, split it into two parts, take the first part, that's my five characters for the hand. I'm adding with ordinality because I'm splitting it to a table. So look at what happens. So first, you see I have hand one, two, three, four, five down below. Look at hand one. When I take this and I split it a second time and I add ordinality to it, right? So I'm starting to chain these things together. And I can do that because I cross join that string to table. It can reference stuff from the actual table data. Oops, not that, I had that highlighted, my apologies. So now I have the first hand, notice I kept that ID column, and then I have five individual cards in that hand, numbered one to five. And this is just building on top of each other. Kind of cool, right? And, uh, and then you can just keep iterating through this. Now, again, what I showed you earlier is I can clean up that top query a little bit, I can just move more functions if they're set returning into the from clause. Is this the most performant thing to do? Eh, no, probably not. But it might help you, you know, come to the solution, understand the way these things are working together. And so I just simply moved this split part down below, and now I just reference it up top. And again, I am hitting control enter, it's the exact same data set that comes out. Does that make sense? All right. Let me show you one really fun thing. This is the Wordle thing really quickly. The exact same principle. We have guesses, right? You can do up to five guesses in a Wordle puzzle. One, two, three, four, five. And then I need to know each individual letter within the guess. So here's what the string look like. So again, I'm taking an example, making a string literal out, out of it. And I'm using a different function here. It's called regex matches. That's gonna get out the, um, the, the data as a an array. So notice the guess is an array, and I kept with ordinality the number of guesses. In this case, they gave five, three guesses. Now I can take that output, I put it in a CTE just to make it simpler. But now I can take that CTE called Wordle score, I can cross join it to another regex matches. So the output of the CTE goes into the next function, and there I say, hey, uh, the first item of the array, which there is only one item in the array, and now I'm gonna look for any existence of one of these uh, emo uh, emojis and split it apart and do with ordinality. So now I have each guess, each letter in the guess, the order they were. Okay, that's cool, so I'm turning this stuff into tabular data. And then to finish it all out, I can now take that tabular data in my select query and I went from emojis to, with each guess, how many correct letters there were, how many partial guesses were correct, and how many incorrect. And I get down to, by the third guess, this person had guessed everything correctly. Do that across lots of queries, and I have this really cool tabular data. I can, with millions of, of, of Wordle stuff, it's pretty fun. All right, so um, I just wanna show this part, and then I'll stop here. All of this stuff is there, I try and do my best putting a lot of comments so you know what's happening if you were to take this example and I show you where to get the data, all of that stuff. I just wanna quickly go over recursive queries again so that you uh, can see it and I'll have one or two minutes for some questions. And always feel free to reach out to me. So this is the most uh, simple example, right? I set up the initial iteration by saying select one, that's gonna be the input to the next iteration. So value was one plus one, that's gonna get me two. I'm gonna keep doing that. Now the next input is gonna say two, plus one is three, and I'm gonna do that until value is less than 10, because if I put 10 in, it's gonna do one more iteration and get me 11. I don't want that. You can do it all kinds of ways. And I keep highlighting stuff, my apologies. 
and we just counted one to ten. That's cool. I'm not going to, you can see it down here. Now you can do it with something like the Fibonacci sequence. It's another one I like to show, right? We all do that. We all learned it with Agile, right? And uh, hey, what is Fibonacci to five, five rows? So I started with, uh, this is my initial query. This is what it started as, right? The zero was the start. The uh, first value is eventually going to be the, the current number is one. And you go by saying, hey, wherever the, um, we call this thing level, iterate it by one, you add the two things together, and so after five iterations, uh, you get eight, right? So the fifth iteration. What is it to 10? And again, this is where if I didn't have this where clause, what would happen? Well, you just get an out of memory error, because eventually the number's gonna get so big, it just, it, it doesn't exist for a big int. Um, so I can say, hey, what is it to 50? It's really big, all right? That is the Fibonacci sequence at 50, the 50th position. And the files on disk, it's the one I showed you in slides, right? So I have this table, uh, it's already there, great. And so that's what it looks like. You're gonna say something? I Sure I could, and I have done that actually. Um, and so this is what the table looks like. Again, the initial query looked like this, right? I got that first row out, folder A. That's the input to the next one. We're joining name to parent folder right here. And if you remember, this is what the parent folder looked like, right? Folder A, folder A, folder A, and so forth. And there is, there are two folder Bs in there. So the second output would be those five rows and now I'm going to iterate all five rows, name, 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 name. A couple of them I'm going to hit when I get to folder B. So the final output is all the way down to folder B. Now because I can uh, connect to it though, I can do things like join parts from the previous query. So pretty quickly I can get to something that looks more like a path. Because I'm taking output from the previous query and concatenating it with output or something from this iteration of the query. That receipt, recursive CTs get really powerful and you can do a lot of fun things with it. Um, in this case, I'm not gonna go through it. Here's what the, um, here's what it looked like in that puzzle. A lot of commands going, you know, listing it, directory, file names, and you could iterate all those. I'll just show you one quick output of it because it is kind of cool. I'm gonna just do this. Yes, I know it's gonna drop. Yes, I'm gonna create that. And here I'm gonna insert this stuff. Now, this is what it looks like right, bunch of rows, and then I can use something cool like regex matches. And so I'm taking it twice, I'm gonna find anything that's a, a CD and anything that's a file, and I'm using regex to identify those positions. And I go space by space, and I can get those rows out. And that continues on, if you pull this file down, you can do the whole example, get to the final result and see what it works. We are almost at the end. I will show you the other reason that I forgot to put in the slides and I will go back and do that. One of the other reasons I love iterating these processes with CTEs, even if it's not performant, is at any level of the CTE, I can put a select statement in. I can check my progress at that point. If something's failing, I can go back and say, huh, what did I do wrong? When I then create the next step of walking the file tree, I can put a select statement there and see what the output is. And as I add the next CTE, if something doesn't work, I can go back and comment it, see what the output is, rethink it. It's one of the other reasons I love using it because it really allows me to debug as I go. That's basically the end. I'll simply show you this. Um, there's all kinds of other stuff. Go look at some of the advent of code. There are so many functions you can use once you start to split this data apart and transform it. You can go crazy and it's fun. Communities where you can help. All of these people and many more helped me learn a lot of this stuff over the last four, five, six years, right? So get in the community if you're not there and you're gonna learn a ton. That's it. We are out of time, but I'm happy to stick around for a couple questions, I apologize. Um, and there's the talk again. Yeah, I don't see Tatiana here yet. So, hey, let's take a question or two, if you have them. If you don't, that's fine too. All right, going once, going twice. Have a great day. Thanks for coming.